people who aren't into TV or pop culture like that might only know Degrassi as the place that weird video of Drake being shot comes from. What you say? Oh, that you only meant well. Did. Others might see it as a cornerstone of their identity, the Degrassi generation as integral to who they are as any other part of their upbringing, like the house they grew up in, or their parents. Whichever kind of person you are, the now hollow halls of Degrassi High had an undeniable impact on three whole generations of people. That's what I'm going to talk about today. But first, my name is Z and I talk about movies, the internet, and myself. And if any of that interests you, be sure to like this video and subscribe. Okay, embarrassing self promo over, tap in. you should know that for me Degrassi was something I was constantly falling in and out of love with as with most long-running shows there were whole seasons where they just weren't giving what they were supposed to have gave when an annoying or unlikable character's plot was made the main focus of an entire season or worse an entire graduating class it made the show basically unwatchable it was hard to watch after Frankie became the main girl because she was not giving like unhinged no common sense energy like Manny and Emma was like she didn't have she was insane but not in like a fun way just in a like annoying way you can't put on the Manny wig and be Manny despite my frequent breaks from the show when I loved it I loved it and I would tune in almost every day for a new episode on Teen Nick especially when the Boiling Point era started but I'll save that for another time for a brief history of Degrassi you should know that Degrassi High didn't really start in Degrassi High it started with the kids after school special the kids of Degrassi Street which was based on a made-for-tv movie which was based on a book kids of Degrassi Street cast kids from the streets of Toronto to have a more real and raw approach similar to kind of like what Euphoria did with um, Angus and other characters. It's also very similar to what Skins did where they cast the real teenagers and have them constantly be weighing in on the scripts and production and everything. The show was real and raw and even though it went off the air in 1986, it was only the beginning of Degrassi's legacy. Several of the child actors from the Kids of Degrassi Street went on to play new characters in Degrassi Junior High, which premiered on the CBC in 1987. The impact of Degrassi Street was undeniable from the very start. I've been trying to rewatch the entire Degrassi universe um, from Kids of Degrassi Street to the last series on Netflix, but that's hella TV and I'm just one person, okay? I'm just the bitch who makes the biscuits. In just 26 episodes, Kids of Degrassi Street was able to snag an international Emmy for children's television programming in 1986, an award that made them getting greenlit for the inaugural season of Degrassi Junior High that much easier. It was really important to the creators of Degrassi that the show grow with the characters, and therefore with its audience. The idea of Degrassi from the creator's own mouth was always to make a program that looked at the world from a children's viewpoint, without the moralizing, cuteness, or condescension that Degrassi's mentor saw as characteristic of most children's television, and without the intrusive adults. If you look at early Degrassi to the very last episode, the only time adults are involved is when something they're doing directly affects the children, like Craig's father being abusive or Ellie's mother being an alcoholic, or if the adult used to be a child in the show. Yes, as Degrassi's audience and characters got older, they started to deal with more and more complex ideas, like going from dealing with vague ideas of grief to someone you distantly knew in Kids of Degrassi Street to main characters passing away in Degrassi Junior High and onward. But from the very beginning, none of the topics they brought up were meant to tell kids how to feel. In a time where shows of all sorts focused on the whole family and not just on the kids, even when the kids were supposed to be the main focus, Degrassi was a trailblazer in the way it continuously centered children. Even the cameras were set at the children's height, looking up at adults or cutting off the top of their head. I think a large part of how Degrassi was able to pull off certain issues like suicide or abortion is because actual kids were playing the kids, not 30 year old. They were forced from the very beginning to be more careful. I'm not saying this to say Degrassi's production and writing were without its faults because it definitely had them, but I do think this was one of its strengths. Completely centering children was especially brave to do 
when over half of their viewers were middle-aged and older. Before I keep talking about why I love Degrassi though, I have to give a quick shout out to some of its most envelope pushing moments, which contributed to the record of trailblazing they maintained for over 15 seasons. First, there was Snake, Mr. Simpson, and his gay older brother. I know we all probably know Mr. Simpson as Mr. Tolerant or Mr. Cheater, <laughs> but he was actually giving a little bit of a homophobic serve in this episode. Similar to Spinner's complicated feelings about Marco being gay, Snake probably reacted as most straight men would react in the 1980s. I'm gay too. You're joking, right? This episode aired 20 years before gay marriage was legalized in Canada. It was later followed by an episode of Degrassi High, where Joey's longtime nemesis, Dwayne, is diagnosed with HIV and struggles with how it affects his life. At the time, the AIDS crisis was so new that it had to be explained to the kids exactly what the virus was. Then, Spike fell pregnant after losing her virginity at a party, an episode that would go on to win Degrassi Junior High another international Emmy. In fact, Emma, who would later go on to be the main character of The Next Generation, was named after the Emmy this episode won. In the series premiere of Degrassi High, Erica walked through a crowd of anti-abortion protesters into an abortion clinic to terminate her pregnancy, something so controversial at the time that the end, where she actually walked through the crowd, wasn't originally shown in the US or Britain. In fact, in Britain, at least some of the material proved too strong for the BBC. Four of the initial 26 episodes of Degrassi Junior High, including the one dealing with lesbianism, were held off the air by BBC One, the channel with the widest viewing audience, and finally run in a later time slot by BBC Two. But that wasn't the last time Degrassi allowed a girl character to fully go through with an abortion, something rare for TV at the time. Even in the more liberal Canada, there were objections to the portrayal of abortion in episodes like Accidents Will Happen and Lola's abortion episode in Next Class. While Lola's episode was one of very few to show the abortion procedure in depth, instead of a fade to black walk into the abortion clinic, the two-part Accidents Will Happen, where Manny Santos discovers she's pregnant and decides to have an abortion, was banned from airing in America for three years, and was instead quietly released on Teen Nick in 2006 during a Degrassi marathon. Speaking of being banned in America, Degrassi High was also the first and second time the word fuck was said on Canadian broadcast TV. It was actually said twice in about the span of a minute in what was supposed to be the grand finale for the Degrassi universe, the 1992 made for TV movie, School's Out. It's also a pretty sickening and iconic scene in my opinion. Joey Jeremiah spends his summer dating Caitlin. Shut up. And fucking Tessa. Oh, what ethics, what a hero. Let's have a great big hand, shall we? Big round of applause, hey? Yes, all right. <laughs> Snake's got a really weird sense of humor. <laughs> Tessa Campanelli? You were fucking Tessa Campanelli? Despite gun violence in the form of school shootings generally being labeled a rising problem in America more so than Canada, or anywhere else, it was also a pressing issue for the Degrassi writers to cover. They did so in the two-part episode Time Stand Still, which saw Rick's bullying and Drake's bad luck converge into something that haunted Degrassi for many seasons afterwards. Then there was JT's death, an eruption of tension that had been brewing for an entire season if not longer. As much as I wish JT hadn't died and as annoying as Mia was after it happened, I do think the scenes and even the episodes leading up to his death were one of Degrassi's better symphonies of drama, everything culminating pretty perfectly into JT getting caught in the crossfire. As opposed to sometimes on Degrassi when things just start randomly happening. The season after JT's death was a lot of the writers fumbling to continue on while having to lean on underdeveloped characters who had previously only existed in the fringes of the show's plots. Depending on who you ask, Degrassi continued to struggle to find its footing, especially after most of the original cast was gone. There was even that weird space of time where Peter's old ass was still in the credits with the young people because... It was free real estate, estate, I guess. Either way, The Next Generation was probably due to end the same way Degrassi High had, with the made-for-TV movie. Interest in the show was dwindling when one of the most iconic trailers of all time hit the airwaves like crack in the fucking 80s. I shouldn't even have to say this. Season 10, Degrassi, there was a shark in the water. There's a shark in the water.
promo, weirdly enough, is the best segue into me saying what it is I love so much about Degrassi. The way it sits at the intersection of information and entertainment. Degrassi has never been about moralizing or telling kids what's right and wrong like they're too unintelligent to make their own decisions. It's about showing the world how it is and showing perspectives you might have never seen before. In the series premiere of Degrassi High, teen mother Spike tells the expecting Erica, Having an abortion was wrong for me. Maybe she feels it's right for her. But you just said it was wrong. For me. But that was my choice. But she's choosing something wrong. Maybe. M maybe not. I mean, it's great to have, you know, high ideals and stuff. But when you're in that situation, right and wrong. They can get really complicated. Degrassi's creators even said, We are not going to wrap things up neatly. We really strive to show the complexity and shades of gray. I think that distinguishes it from a lot of other shows kids have watched over the years. Degrassi is proof of the theory of intelligent shows like Mr. Rogers Neighborhood or Early Cartoon Network. The idea that if you don't talk down to kids or underestimate their intelligence, they're more susceptible to listen to you. Degrassi has also never been about shock value or endangering kids just to get a scene people would talk about. When they portrayed Cameron to the side, the creator said they were extremely sensitive to any kind of triggering or copycats, and they didn't want it to be exploitive. In fact, a part of the money spent on Degrassi High by the public TV system went towards producing teacher's guides and other materials that assisted schools using the show in their curriculum. With these morals, Degrassi still managed to have several plots that were not only trailblazing, but genuinely shocking for me to watch the first time. There are a lot of ridiculous plots in Degrassi, don't get me wrong. The Kevin Smith thing, the Kiki Palmer thing, the Natasha Bedingfield thing, the second school shooter plot, students sleeping with teachers and it being handled terribly by the writers, Emma and Spinner getting married, Liberty dressing as Napoleon Bonaparte, JT's tiny dick, JT's brief stint as Jamie Lee Curtis. Hey Liberty girlfriend! all absolutely insane and honestly not even in a fun way. <laughs> Degrassi also had a bad habit of randomly making a sport or activity super important at school and then never mentioning it again. Manny and the gymnastics team, the hockey team, the football team. I could only find the ridiculousness of some plots endearing, a word I use very loosely regarding some of these plot lines, because I left middle school and high school and can look back at the people I met, my initial reactions and projected paths for them, and see how few of them ended up exactly how I thought they would. Weirdly enough, I think Degrassi's ridiculousness makes it one of the few shows that somewhat accurately depict how much people change in the four years they spend in high school. Some kids I went to high school with have kids of their own, and some are already on their way to their second college degree. Some of them aren't here anymore. Life can be stranger than fiction. There are also a lot of non-crazy plot lines that still stick with me, ones that I can only understand the magnitude of now that I'm older. Degrassi's treatment of Hazel wasn't perfect, and you can watch her actress's video about it because she's made multiple. But to have Muslim characters talk about their treatment post 9-11 was very brave. When Adam's plotline first came in, in the later part of The Next Generation, I didn't know what a transgender man was. At the time I was pretty young, by the way, don't cancel me. <laughs> Obviously, having a cis woman play a trans man was a fucking mess of them, and someone definitely isn't seeing heaven for it, but the fact that Adam even existed is kind of like crazy to me because the people around me didn't start talking about transgender people or the idea of being transgender for a very long time after that. Later on, Degrassi does attempt to redeem itself in its portrayal of gender by making Gael, I think that's their name, non-binary. One newer plotline that always stuck with me was Zoe Rivas coming to terms with her lesbianism. Specifically the scene where she decides to have sex with Winston to prove she likes men and ends up violently sobbing after she can't do it. As I've been re-watching Degrassi, I've tried to look for the reason that I always seem to come back to the show, no matter how long I stray. Degrassi is a comfort show for me, yes, but I started asking myself why I find it comforting. And I realized that the real lesson of every generation, the root of the root, the thing that Degrassi always had to say, was that if you could be strong enough, lucky enough, to survive childhood, then there would be an entire world waiting for you.